Hello and uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, coming today. It's a very quiet day in town and it's a quiet day uh, at the Wilson Center too. We are delighted to have with us here an old friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Fatima Spati Qasim. We go back at least, uh, I would say, uh, 10 years, if not more, uh, we did, uh, when we started working together, uh, Fatima was in charge of the gender program at Esqua in uh, Beirut, and we did, uh, I believe, three workshops together in Beirut, and then continued working together in Amman and also at the Wilson Center. Uh, I remember Fatima always telling me that once she retires, she will finish the dissertation she had started earlier and then turn it into a book. So the book is called Party, Politics, Religion, and Women's Leadership. Lebanon in comparative perspective. The comparative perspective of it is very interesting and timely given what is going on in uh, the region today when it comes to women's uh, issues. So um, um, I would like to invite uh, Fatima to talk maybe 30 to 35 minutes and then we will open the floor for a discussion. You have the floor. It's on, you just pull it more yeah, near you. So that people okay. see me because it's the same height. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Hale. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to speak once again at the Wilson Center. And I thank Dr. Hale Sfandiari, who's the director of the Middle East program for giving me the opportunity to introduce my book to this distinguished audience. Yes, we go a long way back, and That's we worked very well together. Uh, I think Hali uh, spoke uh, um, very well about our relationship, but I would rather say that it takes two to tango. <laughs> um, in one of her eloquent speeches, Michelle Bachelet, <coughs> former president of Chile and former executive director of UN Women, told a story about a Chilean boy, an eight-year Chilean boy, asking his parents, can a man become president of Chile? If anything, this anecdote should be interpreted as a call by the younger generation for equal opportunities. This is what this book is all about. The Arab uprisings reignited linkages between Islam, democracy, and women's station. This book probes deeper and explores the interlinkages of party politics, religion, and women's leadership. The research is unique in that exa it examines for the first time, variations in party aspects and policies towards women, singling out party religiosity as a core explanatory variable for women's political leadership. I will talk first about the conundrum that motivated this book, the main research question, the contours of the theory that it lays out, and the main findings and some takeaway points. And I conclude with few remarks linking what's going on in the Arab world, the Arab uprisings, to 
the theory that the book lays out. First of all, what's the conundrum? We look at gender gaps and we see that they are lingering worldwide. This is most pronounced in the public sector, particularly in developing and Arab countries. Witness the male-dominated governments, parliaments, and political parties. The Arab, the world average for female parliamentary representation, which is the most commonly invoked indicator for women's political participation, did not exceed 20% in 2012 and 2013. It is highest for the Nordic countries at 42%, and lowest for the Arab countries, the group of Arab countries, at 11%. This rank improved somewhat recently after the uh, Saudi monarch appointed 30 women to the Shura Council in Saudi Arabia. They were appointed, not elected, so this makes a difference too. Studies have shown that as women's educational attainment improves, their economic contribution, and subsequently their political involvement are enhanced. However, against theoretical expectations, statistics show that between 1995 and 2010, women's gains in the public sector, as MPs, I'm taking the lower house, were far below actually half those in the private sector, as CEOs and corporate managers. This is the conundrum that motivated this book. Previous scholarship attempted to explain women's political performance by looking at the country level, their development level, their GDP per capita, whether develop, develop, developed or developing or least developed, their GDP per capita, their political regimes, whether democratic, non-democratic, autocratic, electoral systems, and in electoral systems, there are many variations. You have the proportional or mixed representation. You have the choice of closed or open electoral lists, the choice of large or small districts, uh, or giving uh, according quotas for women or not. And then, not only at the country level, they went a bit lower, at a lower level of analysis, the society, looking at political culture, as an explanation, or religious convictions. Indeed, one observes that almost all democracies have high levels of female representation, while autocracies invariably have lower or no female representation, if they maintain parliaments at all. However, one also observes that there are underachievers among democracies, you have the example of Japan, you have Ireland, Luxembourg, and you have also overachievers among non-democracies and autocracies, like Afghanistan, Bangladesh, the EAU, the UAE, United Arab Emirates, or Saudi Arabia, as I mentioned earlier. Take Rwanda, for example. Rwanda is a superachiever. It is a least developed country. It has 62% female representation, the highest worldwide. There's also a large group of countries in the middle. Democracies, non-democracies, democratizing countries with unexplained variations in female representation. So this leads me to what's the main research question? What are we looking for? The diversions from the general pattern call for a different level of explanation in female representation, which an argument based solely on differences in development levels or income or political regimes or hostility of world, world religions, particularly Islam to women, do not seem to provide. These arguments fail to explain observed variations in female representation and leadership. Therefore, one is apt to question what makes the Nordic countries stand out in female representation and women's leadership. Their political parties seem to take concrete measures and affirmative action to empower women and promote them to leadership positions. So 
The question is, can parties explain variations in female representation and leadership across countries and parties? Political parties can be the main vehicles, rather forklifts for women's ascendance to leadership positions. They are gatekeepers in elections. They recruit women. They, se they recruit, select, nominate, and promote women to public office. The equality and capacity of political parties has a direct impact on parliamentary performance and organization, affecting the legislative nature capacity of members elected. The promotion of equal participation and representation of women in politics and the representatives with political positions in parliamentary structures. Therefore, I go beyond country level to explanations to the institutional party level structures. I look through the lens of political parties and unpack their characteristics to understand what's women's leadership opportunities within inner party echelons. However, different parties offer women different opportunities. One need only consider the different roles that women play in political parties. For instance, women may be leaders of parties and or heads of government in Christian Democratic uh, Party in Germany or in the Labour Party in Britain. However, their role is virtually non-existent in Taliban in Afghanistan or the Calvinist party in the Netherlands, where women were first not allowed even to become members and now are allowed to run but not compete for leadership. This leads me to the main research question. Why are some parties superior to others in promoting women's leadership. I explore party characteristics and party policies towards women. I examine their religious and non-religious goals and contents of political platforms, their membership composition, the internal practices and procedures, and their leadership body bodies, the composition of their leadership bodies, the decision-making bodies. In the wake of the Arab uprisings, the rise of Islamist parties brought to the fore dormant fears and apprehensions of the adverse influence of some religious families on the station of women and their leadership opportunities. In fact, there is a common perception that some world religions, Islam, Catholicism, Judaism, Hinduism, are hostile to women and are antithetical to women's leadership. Some scholars even point out that religion is frequently the reason for discrimination, injustice, and exclusion. It's a marker of social, for social marginalization. One reason is thought to be for religions to be inimical to liberal democratic policies is that conservative and fundamentalist religious groups frequently hold and proclaim opinions that are illiberal. One of the most contentious issues in this respect is the attitude of religious groups toward the role of women. These religious groups often have affiliated parties that carry their conservative values into politics, adversely influencing women's prospects for leadership and public office. In this respect, religions function not unlike other ideologies and that they provide a unified, structured way of seeing the world, affecting the lives and thoughts of adherents, including mostly women. Moreover, religious tenets are often conflated with traditions, customs, and norms, especially in conservative societies, stunting women's advancement. In eighth chapter, this book, advances and tests, it's okay, it's okay, <laughs> this book advances, and by the way, this book is designed, the cover design is by my own daughter, who's an architect. <laughs> and it, it is the, it uh, carries the color, the feminist color, and the feminist symbol with the cross and the halal, the crescent. So it really is interesting. And I thanked her for it. 
So in eight chapters, the book advances and tests the theory that as party religiosity rises, women's leadership falls. In other words, women's leadership is more likely to increase, and that's the theory, in parties of lower religiosity and to fall in parties of higher religiosity. This is distinct and different from an analysis that might look to female parliamentary representation, the most commonly invoked indicator, as I mentioned before, for women's political participation. This cannot be captured by data that counts elected politicians, because ultimate representation in elected office is also dependent on the electoral system and voters' preferences. It offers an incomplete snapshot of female leadership and may be a noisy signal of party attitudes toward women. Therefore, I propose two additional indicators. Women's share in parties' leadership bodies and as nominees on their electoral lists for public office. The unit of analysis in the, in the book is political parties. It's not women, it's political parties. The theory of party variation and religiosity posits the intensity of religiosity as its core explanatory variable. It is the extent, what, what do I, how do I define party religiosity? It's the extent to which religious goals and components incorporated or articulated in political platforms, in the party's political platforms, penetrate their agendas. Other independent variables are considered, including their democratic practices and procedures in leadership transitions and in decision making. This is, we're always talking about political parties, inner structures. I also in, consider pluralism in sex and in sect of membership. Female membership, party denomination, and party strength. Party strength is the share of that party in parliament, how many seats they occupy. Women's leadership is the main dependent variable, so I'm really trying to explain what is women's leadership. It refers to the share of women in top executive, legislative, and decision-making bodies within the parties, like uh, politburos, supreme councils, and committees. <clears throat> in all parties, they have this, but they have different names. So, but the, the functions are the same, and this is what I'm looking at. A central distinction that the book makes is between public Islam, or deprivatized Islam, and private Islam. Public Islam is communal, where the space between the public and private religion collapses, leaving little ro room for maneuvering for the private individual to maneuver. This suffocates women's advancement and thwarts the re leadership opportunities. I also distinguish in the book between institutional or party religiosity and individual religiosity, which is understood as the piety, the faith, the practices. And between religion and religiosity, I am not talking about religion or religion, uh, religious convictions. I'm talking about goals on political platforms, which I call religiosity. The book adopts a multivocal understanding of religions in that there are several voices and interpretations within the same religious family and multiple secularisms and religiosities. As such, there is no divide or dichotomy, the, the usual, the common uh, idea between secular and religious parties but a continuum of multiple religiosities and secularisms within the party. So content analysis, what did, what did I do? How did I manage this? I did content, I undertook content analysis of relevant parties. Relevant parties meaning I chose those parties that have at least one seat in parliament. The others are not relevant. So content analysis was instrumental in classifying the parties. I had to classify them by the intensity of religiosity into three generic categories, religious and secular, civil confessional, 
a mixture of civil and confessional, yani confessional parties with civil goals, and religious parties are also broken down into three, tolerant, conservative, and extremist religiosity. An ordinal measure of party religiosity was developed ranging from a score of one for the highest religiosity parties to five lowest religiosity parties. First, what is the method that I used? The theory is tested statistically on 330 parties and found to travel across 26 countries in this world, in Asia, Africa, and Europe. These are composed 13 Arab countries, seven non-Arab Muslim countries, Muslim majority countries. Muslim majority meaning 50% and above uh, Muslims. And five European countries with Christian democratic parties and Israel, the only Jewish state. All these countries, the criteria that I used, allow parties to form and compete and hold periodic elections. And I'm not saying democratic or undemocratic, they hold elections periodically. Such re research parameters have not been addressed by studies pitched at the country level. They can't. All 330 parties are relevant in that they hold at least one seat in the current national parliament covered by the research period, which was between 2007 and 2010. In so doing, I was able to compare the influence of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism on women's leadership within inner party echelons. Towards this end, a unique database on women in political parties in the 26 countries was compiled on the basis of which a multivariate regression model for women's leadership was estimated. The statistical findings strongly support theoretical explanations that party religiosity can explain a large proportion of variation in women's leadership across the 330 parties. The statistical database, for, for your knowledge, is now archived at the, with, the, uh, with ARDA, the State University of Pennsylvania, for use for public use by researchers, feminists, and comparativists in political science. So that was the first step, the comparative country ca multiple cases study. The second step was, encouraged by the positive findings in the multiple cases study, and in order to test the theory further and find qualitative evidence, I needed explanations beyond statistics, beyond numbers. I took Lebanon, I selected Lebanon as a uh, single case study. It's, Lebanon is an interesting showcase because of its multi-party system, multiple parties of varying religiosities, and multiple social and conflict-bearing religious cleavages, which widened and intensified in a 15-year civil war which took place between 1975 and 1990 in Lebanon. Additionally, one can test a theory in a controlled environment for, statistic, uh, for people who are conversant with statistics. This is a controlled environment where the electoral system and the political regime is under control, so they don't uh, bear an influence on women's leadership. Another main factor for showcasing Lebanon is the puzzling situation of its women. Women in Lebanon are mostly very highly uh, qualified in social and economic terms, their education, their uh, economic contribution, but their political performance is a puzzle. It's the governments, in government we barely, the Lebanese have barely have one woman in, in government or none at all, and they, the percentage, the female representation is now 3% the maximum it was 5% a couple of years ago, a couple of parliaments ago. In comparison to other Arab countries, to women in other Arab countries of equal or similar uh, high socioeconomic uh, qualifications, Lebanon hits rock bottom. I mean, it's, it's, and there's no explanation so far. But with the multi uh, regression model, I was able to pinpoint 
the issue that it is it might be party religiosity that may explain a large proportion of the variance across parties in Lebanon. So qualitative evidence culled from 150, 150 structured and semi-structured interviews with male and female elites in 18 relevant parties, occupying at least one seat in the 2009 parliament, support, justify, and explain statistical results. This evidence re reveals that elites in extremist and conservative religious parties continue to exhibit anti-women as leaders attitudes towards women and their political careers. These attitudes are more pronounced and entrenched when party leaders double as clerics entrusted with interpreting the doctrine and controlling the fate of women within these parties. As such, these women unfriendly attitudes and regressive discourses, notably that politics is a man's business or women's place is at home and women's leadership is in violation of the Sharia. They invoke al-qiwama, they invoke al-wilaya, certain issues in Quran which they claim cannot allow women to lead. These perceptively block women's ascendance to leadership in religious extremist parties of highest religiosity in comparative perspective to the asecular or the civil confessional parties. Previous explanations, as I mentioned, for women's leadership do not necessarily rest on the notion that all religions are essentially unegalitarian. However, since men continue to dominate the, theologic, uh, the theological realm, they exercise a near monopoly over jurisprudence and interpretation of the doctrine. Some scholars have argued that many religions have been formally structured by men to exclude women from key roles and to retain gendered power advantages over women. Accordingly, women's advancement to leadership positions within formal religious structures was often blocked by the men who dominated those spaces. By extension, whenever clergymen double as party leaders, they also tend to thwart women's leadership in the political realm. In 2013, Jimmy Carter stated that, the truth is that male religious leaders have had and still have an option to interpret holy teachings, either to exalt or to subjugate women. They have, for their own selfish reasons, overwhelmingly chosen the latter. Simultaneously, they have the authority, that is the clerics, the party leaders, to execute women unfriendly policies at the party level. In some religions, women are blocked from public leadership because of the doctrine using the pretext of doctrinal violations, while in some democratic deficit countries, women are not even given equal opportunities to run for public office or compete for party leadership. Consequently, women are subjected to the double jeopardy, that of gender bias and of religion, religious hostility, reducing their chances to assume leadership. The relation between religions and religious cultures, democracy, and female empowerment has been broadly explored by Huntington, Fish, Fox, who argue that Islam is not compatible with democracy. They provide empirical evidence of the prevalence of democratic deficits in most Arab countries and, most, and some non-Arab Muslim majority countries, which is manifested and their non-democratic political institutions and is behind the substandard station of women, including their low female representation. However, taking Arab and non-Arab Muslim majority countries in comparative perspective, one finds that several non-Arab Muslim majority countries rank high on the democracy scale of Polity 4 and Freedom House uh, scales indices like Indonesia, Senegal, Turkey, Albania, Bosnia, Bangladesh, among others. Additionally, in these countries, one finds that women and men are given equal opportunities and that female parliamentary representation is comparable to that of in most developed countries. Among the Arab countries, you have Comoros, Djibouti, and Lebanon that rank high or 
you know, relatively well on the democracy scale, although female representation remains low. This demonstrates that one, Islam is no bar to democracy. Two, Islam is not a barrier to women's leadership. Three, claims of Arab exceptionalism are not justified. Four, the Manichian divide that all democracies are good and all non-democracies are bad is questionable. What are the main findings of the book? And some takeaway points. One, that party religiosity can explain a large proportion of the variance in women's leadership. Two, that qualitative and quantitative evidence show that parties of lower uh, religiosity are indeed superior. This is answering the main uh, question. They're, they show the highest chairs in their leadership bodies. And they are superior to those of extremist religiosity which have none, no women, or, or very infinitesimal shares of women in their leadership bodies. Three, there is a mismatch between female membership and leadership in parties with expansive religious platforms, which the theory can explain. They have huge female membership, but promote very few women to leadership positions. Some religious parties are willing to overlook their conservative religious stance against women's leadership when it is in their interest to do so. Justifying, so they forget about evoking the Sharia, but when it is politically in their interest to do so, they justify that by the ends, justify the means. And this is based on the research. Women's wings within parties, there are women departments within parties. These marginalize and ghettoize women by separating them from the decision-making circles uh, within the party. This is against the grain of the gender paradigm and gender mainstreaming. They claim that they're doing this for women's sake, but in fact, they are marginalizing them. Six, the presence of large female membership within parties creates a critical mass of women. As agents of change, they lobby to have more women in uh, leadership bodies and on nom nomination lists, thereby raising female representation in public office. This draws what we call a tripartite career path for women in politics. This is not uh, uh, in the Arab world, it's yet, or in Lebanon, it's yet to be uh, seen. Seven, parties seek women for electioneering purposes and to mobilize other women. And because women have added value, they enhance parties' public image, and being the symbol of the modern, many parties have women, just to show that they are a symbol of the modern, and they are perceived, that women are perceived as less corruptible than men. And there are studies that show that. I'm not against men. <laughs> uh, eight, religious mobilization, targeting, targeting poor women is very effective especially when combined with financial and in-kind in incentives. And one issue is the money for veiling that has been, uh, uh, is a rumor around the Arab world or the Muslim world that they pay them to veil. And this, is, this might explain the surge of veiled women across the region. Nine, different religious families offer women different opportunities. For instance, Christian majority parties tend to promote women to leadership and to nominate more women to public office than to public office than Muslim majority parties. And Shiite majority parties more than Sunni majority parties because the Sunnis are more conservative and the Shia. And there's a, a whole lot of explanation on this and uh, the uh, the uh, ishtihad, what we call the, the explanation is more open among Shiites. 10, it seems that municipalities constitute a breakthrough for women or local government, for women in politics and are a stepping stone to parliamentary and public office. So what are my concluding remarks? The theory of party religiosity advanced in the book travels. It is robust, explanatory, generalizable, and has predictive powers. It can explain the frustrating situation of women in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings, the rise of Islamists, 
women unfriendly environment, the threats of the rollback of in, in a number of women's rights, the outcome of ele elections and the female representation in several Arab countries are but few manifestations. In advancing the theory of party religiosity, I do not claim that joining political parties is a magical wand or formula for women's empowerment and leadership. Parties must give women who choose politics equal opportunities. However, more often than not, women, the parties require that women be 100% perfect and eligible for leadership, although many men are not. One should go beyond numbers to measure women's political environment, involvement. The desired outcome should be quantity, not quality, and effective leadership, not cosmetic representation. A word of caution. Even when the formal procedures for leadership transitions are relatively open and formally democratic, a women unfriendly political culture blocks women's ascendance to leadership roles. Thus, there are formal procedures which are not in tandem with informal political culture in parties with theocratic agendas. Witness the case of Kuwait. These tend to bar women's leadership in theocratic parties with highest intensity of religiosity, like the Salafis do. Parties must be enticed via women-friendly electoral laws by incentives such as gaining electoral strength for nominating more women on their electoral lists. These incentives undercut voter and gender bias. This is necessary, but not sufficient measure for enhancing women's leadership. However, women's leadership is also dependent upon women's interests and preferences, but above all, above all, freedom of choice to draw their career path. Not all women want to go into politics. Women are not voiceless anymore. They are vocal, have managed to break the wall of fear. This is irreversible. They have learned to impose their presence. The uprisings, the Arab uprisings, are a watershed and constitute a turning point for female activism. A woman's spring will eventually dawn when homegrown, and I repeat, homegrown democracy prevails and once religion is deprivatized, democracy will ensure gender equality and women's political empowerment and leadership. But what kind of democracy does the Arab world want? I leave you with the million dollar question. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Fatima, in, in, the, in your research, did you look at the case of Iran or not? Uh, Although it was, I mean, it's not part do, of do, the- Do you want me to? answer right away. Yeah, yeah. We take one question at a time. Okay. That's our system. Uh, so did you Iran did not company? fit did not fit mm -hmm. the criteria that mm -hmm. I took. It's not one of the seven non Arab Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. uh, because because of many things. It's not uh, it doesn't hold uh, uh, democratic elections. It's not high on the democracy scale. Mm -hmm. It's not like Senegal, Turkey, Albania. Okay. I took the countries that ha are high on the democracy scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has a problem with, with parties. <laughs> it has. Yeah, sure. So my, the two criteria that I was using is mm -hmm. that uh, uh, they allow parties to form and compete in elections. Mm -hmm. All parties, yeah, and uh, they they uh, they hold elections periodically, and they are, they have they are well on top of the democracy list. Um, but I looked at Iran. Yeah, that's. I mean, I'm I had to look uh, because yeah. Iran is, is is a specific case, is a yeah. is a special case. Yeah, it it yeah. it didn't fit the, In but the, mm -hmm. it had the same. Uh, let me. I mean. As far as parties are concerned, I didn't have any input on, into parties because I, my main 
research unit was political parties. I didn't have any insight on the. They don't have political parties. Check. Yes. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Fatma, for that nice presentation. Um, I'm Andrea Rue, Middle East Institute. Um, I wanted to ask how your model would fit a country like the U.S., where we only have 18 percent women in the Congress. And uh, that's only slightly above the Arab countries and certainly not anywhere near the Nordic countries. Um, I, could I ask another <laughs> quick question? Yes, sure. Um, also, I'm interested that quite often in the Middle East, um, parties don't want to put up women because they say they won't get elected. So they're wasting candidates um, by um, putting up women. So those are my two questions. Okay. Very interesting. Uh, the, the, the book addresses this issue about uh, they don't want to uh, put up women, you know, in order not to lose uh, seats in parliament. Uh, the way I dealt with this was uh, through the uh, qualitative evidence, I was able to find that parties that are strong party strength, that I have a large number of, of seats in parliament, are normally willing to take that risk. But parties that are weak, they have one or two seats, they, they do not uh, take the risk of nominating women. And that's why my f last finding was that municipalities is a breakthrough, because the in one chap chapter, I compare between women running for parliament and for municipalities. And I find, I found that, uh, you know, they, the men feel that, or the parties feel that uh, the, men, uh, the, the women do not fit in parliament because uh, they don't want to give up their seats for women. It's uh, long-term prestige. Uh, uh, it's, it's different uh, than, and women do not want to, they don't want to risk. Uh, municipalities open a better window for women to enter into politics. So they will say, let, them, let us start by giving them the opportunity to, to run in local government and then, you know, as if it's a ladder, it's a hierarchical now, uh, ladder. As far as the U.S. is concerned, I, I just want to remind you, I was, I'm studying religiosity, party religiosity. I took five countries in Europe that have Christian democratic parties. They have Christian democratic parties in the title only. If we do the content analysis of their agendas or political pla platforms, that would allow me to see if the U.S. fits or not. I need to study their, the, the, the po political platform to see if there are any religious goals. What do I mean by religious goals? Meaning that some parties, and I take the extremist parties, they want to change the system of governance. Their aim is to change, for example, if you take, you know, the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, or, or the Hezbollah in Lebanon before, not now. They wanted to make, Le to turn Lebanon into a, 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 an Islamic state. This is their changing the system of governance. So it's a whole different kettle of fish that we're talking about. But, but the, uh, if you have Christian Democratic parties in the title, and you don't have any religious goals or very few religious goals or only attending to the interests of Christians uh, in, in Lebanon, for example, then this is not a really strong religious goal. It's only attending to the interests of their uh, uh, members. But we can, we can apply it. I, I, uh, I simply did not go into Latin America or America, North America. Right. Um, Stanley Colbert, right at the end, you stressed homegrown. This seemed to imply you Americans don't push us too far on these issues because you're making it more difficult for us. 
And now you have a, a more, you Who know, is I, I was wondering, you would see when you, when you stress homegrown like this, that's what I infer, but it's, I, I just wanted to know if that's what you were saying, because there's a debate in this town. What is the right thing that we should do? Are we making it more difficult for people if we put pressure, because then it looks like they are simply yielding to the outside force that they are not authentic in their own societies? Thank you for the question. This issue of homegrown democracy, in my interviews, uh, many statements point, resent being linked to any Western influence. So when we talk about homegrown, it means you don't want to impose democracy from above. And democracy cannot be imposed. It has to come from within. It has to grow. You have to, it, ha it is a whole culture of, of democracy. You, you can't bring it from, from the West. And, and, and this is, many of the people complained about this, that you're, you're talking about parties, this is a, a, a Western uh, uh, view of, of political parties competing for elections, and democracy is Western, and then uh, why should we enter into it? When we talk about this, I mean, you have to bear in mind that, uh, that the, the re and I, I, uh, I'm telling you, this is based on in-depth research in Lebanon, where we have 18, 18 different uh, religious factions, religious sects, and one is open <laughs> to the public. <laughs> So, so you need to, to let the, uh, the society, the polity, reach that decision. You can't impose it from above. And you don't want them to feel threatened that you're getting something Western and impose, uh, growing it there where it doesn't grow. Bring a plant. I'll give you an example. Bring a, 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 a papaya plant that is from the, from, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the exotic fruits and take them to the, the region, it will not grow. The same thing, it's the same thing. It has to grow, it's homegrown. Yes, please. You mentioned Saudi Arabia a couple of times. Saudi doesn't have any parties and women are not allowed to vote. They're supposed to start voting in 2015. How do you see women developing within Saudi Arabia? Does your research indicate any of that, how that's going to happen? Saudi Arabia is not part of my research. It doesn't fit. It doesn't have parties. It doesn't have parties. It doesn't have voters. It, it doesn't have parliament. I mentioned it in my, in my presentation. How I see it, it's different. I mean, you, d you, you can't see things. Uh, the, the, the situation of, of women in Saudi Arabia from afar. You have to go and see them. I'll tell you, they're, they're highly educated women there. And what you hear, what we hear in the, in overseas, is not exactly what's going on. Maybe, I mean, okay, they don't drive, they don't have the right to drive, but that's not the end of it. They are, they have their, uh, their they're good in business, they have uh, their own markets, they're businesswomen, they're uh, bright uh, uh, women, they're educated, highly qualified. Whether or not the 30 women in the Shura Council can make a difference, it le remains to be seen. We can't say uh, uh, outright, uh, you know, now, if it's going to work or not. Fatima, the Saudis are going to have local council elections and they said women can yeah, yes. run yeah, yeah. for that. Yeah, this is Do they thing. have a quota system for no, that no. or no? No, no, no. They don't? No. They just have to run like yeah, others? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, yes. Lebanon, we're, we're fighting yes. for a quota and we don't have a quota. Yeah. And then in the back. Uh, just to, be to, to comment on the homegrown, uh, even the gender concept did not fly in the Arab world because it's imported. But if you, if when it was adapted <coughs> to the culture, there was no problem. Mm. So it has to be, like she said, homegrown. It has to be adapted to the culture and to, 
Uh, just to comment on uh, Fatma, the, the, um, uh, I find that women themselves are not uh, working towards uh, more leadership in, in the, uh, at least in Lebanon, I know that. And when, vote, when voting comes, they don't vote for women. So it's, we have to change the culture that is reigning in, I mean, politics are regarded as dirty. And women don't want to get <laughs> dirty by being involved in politics. And this is a concept that is really widespread. And I think we have to work on, on changing the image of uh, the political participation of women the, uh, as well as changing the, the, uh, the uh, uh, leadership, I mean, uh, in the, uh, in, uh, including women in the political parties. So it has to be from both sides. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree with you, Bushra. Um, I, um, I'll give you an example. 60% the last elections we had, that was in 2009, 60% of the voters were women. If women recognize, realize how powerful they are, they can make, they can change things in, 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 in parliament, they can change it. Because if 60% of voter turnout are women, then if they, uh, if they, they can choose the, their representatives. Now, about, about the culture of leadership and so on, and that's why I said at the end, it's a matter of choice. I, we, you can't impose a, a political career on women. And I'm, I'm not, I did not study women, I studied political parties. So this, this is a, a but I, I agree with you. I mean, there are many, uh, uh, you know, rumors that say women don't vote for women and women are backstab women and especially when they work together they don't work well together i mean there's a lot of this going on but it needs to be scientifically uh, you know justified uh, yes please Hello, um, Alison Brisk from here at the Wilson Center. Um, I really appreciate this study. I find it very intriguing and useful. I'm a political scientist also. Um, I'd like to think in terms of the generalizability and how it cuts across. Can you raise your voice? I can't, you need, uh, I can't, I can't yeah, hear. Yeah, it's difficult in, to hear you in okay. the front. Okay, in terms of generalizability and um, how this travels uh, beyond the Middle East, um, I was thinking about, um, India, which I think shows a very similar pattern and where a, the Hindu fundamentalist party is poised to win elections. And I've been thinking about that because uh, Modi, the, the uh, leader of the party, um, was indicted, not convicted, but indicted for supervising, um, you know, ethnic cleansing riots against Muslims in 2002, uh, which also included a lot of violence against women. And um, so this is a matter of some concern. Um, and um, I wonder whether the overlap between religious parties and ethnic parties and or uh, religious parties that have been involved somehow in sectarian conflict, the conflict and violence and the ethnic and religious. I was also thinking about Sri Lanka. You know, there are a lot of places where religious parties are also ethnic parties and or their structures for mobilizing violence. Whether there are elections or not, you know, even in democratic countries, there can be very high levels of violence. So I guess the violence and the ethnic question. Thank you. Um, India is not part of the, my, my uh, 26 countries. It's, although it has a lot, many Muslims, you know, but it's not a Muslim majority country. So it drops out. And India is one, is the leading democratic country in the, in the uh, developed, developing world. And there is, that's why I said, um, in, in my presentation I talked about cleavages, social cleavages, and I said conflict bearing religious cleavages. This also includes ethnic cleavages. 
And I studied the Asian, the, the Southeast Asian countries, and I found, I mean, I had to study wor some uh, uh, people, who, scholars who had done work in that part of the world and found similar results. And this is why this strengthens, actually, my, my, uh, the theory. It is generalizable. It is, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of violence against women, and they, they, they put them aside. They don't promote them to leadership. So I agree with you. And it's, it's in, in, the, in the book, if you get uh, to read it, uh, there's, you know, at, I think in the first chapter or second chapter, I mentioned this because, you know, you have to, it's a comparative study, so, yes. Uh, Fatima, uh, I asked you the first question, I'll ask you the last question. Has Iraq been successful? I mean, the Iraqi political parties, have they been more successful because of the system they had that every third candidate has to be a woman? to get more women candidate in parliament than any other countries than you looked at? Yeah, yes. The short question is yes. Quotas, definitely quotas. The, the, the formula for, for uh, uh, enhancing or increasing female representation is the following. You have proportional representation as an electoral, uh, the electoral law, you should have large electoral districts, not small electoral districts. You should have the electoral lists, or, or I mean, I can't say, no, I'm not being normative, but I'm just putting the criteria. The electoral lists, the better, the, the closed, ranked, and zipped lists give women a boost, you know, enhance their uh, chances. So in that sense, the Iraqis, have a quota, they, are, they have to, the parties are ensuring that even within the parties, there is a quota, and on their electoral lists, they have ranked. So this, and it, the Tunisians too, the, the Moroccans too, so this enhances, I mean, we have examples, uh, a plethora of examples all over, they didn't reach the Nordic countries or the, the developed countries where they are if they did not have a quota. You know, as an interim measure, as an interim measure to give them a boost. In French, they say they give them Russia. Yeah. You give them a, po a boost for women to, to be there to get, you know, the societies are used to seeing men. They have to get used to seeing women in leadership positions. So this way, you know, for, for one or two or three rounds of elections, you have to give the quota. And the quota is proving uh, its worth. Now, many parties, for example, I, I talked about the Nordic countries. In the Nordic countries, what they do is that they have internal voluntary quotas for women in leadership. You see, this is what makes them different. It's voluntary, it's not imposed, it's not legislated, it's not constitutional. It is voluntary. The party itself is liberal, democratic, and wants to give equal opportunity. So what do they do? They give a, they, they uh, set a vota, uh, a quota for women for the, in their leadership bodies. One of the parties in Lebanon is doing this. And um, I mean, in my interviews uh, so far, I haven't. Uh, you need to follow up to find out if if they <laughs> what they said uh, is true. Yeah. Um, on behalf of the Middle East program at the, uh, the Gender Women Leadership Initiative at the Wilson Center, please join me in thanking Thank you. Uh, Thank Dr. You. Dr. <laughs> and uh, we distributed the flyers of the book. If you use the flyers, you get 20% off from yes. the uh, publisher. Thank you very much, Ali. Thank you, Ali. Thank, Thank you very much, very Ali. Good. Excellent. I had another question. I didn't have time to ask it. But, yeah, uh, sure. You mentioned uh, the video.